Well, it's my extremely great pleasure today to have with me, uh, remotely at any rate, um, a figure who has been very important in my intellectual development, Dr. John Cutting. He's probably the person alive to whom I owe most, intellectually speaking. And that's largely because of something that happened almost on a whim and that might ever not have happened. I was working at the, the Maudsley Hospital in the Institute of Psychiatry, and I saw advertised a lecture uh, by Dr. Cutting, who I didn't know, and the topic was the right cerebral hemisphere and psychiatric disorders, which was um, the title of a book that in that year, 1990, was published by OUP. And I was intrigued because I had already asked a number of questions to myself about lateralization, but I had no framework in which to put it. And I went along to this talk and was completely blown away by what I was hearing which was that effectively the two hemispheres had a different take on the world and that to one, what is implicit is more readily available than to the other. What is embodied is more available than to the other, but what is unique is better understood than to the other. And in each case, this was the right hemisphere, which as people who know uh, anything about this area will know is not capable of speech. And I'd been puzzling for a very long time why it was that I couldn't express certain problems I had with the way in which when we took a work of literature and made it explicit, it lost its uniqueness, it lost its meaning, um, and it became entirely disembodied and abstract. And I found no language in which to say this clearly. I had tried in a book called Against Criticism, but there it was. John was telling me, it's no surprise because the right hemisphere is the one that understands the implicit, understands uniqueness, understands embodiment, sees things in context, and the left hemisphere, relatively speaking, doesn't. So afterwards, I was bold enough to go up to John and say, that was an absolutely fantastic talk. Um, and in fact, I wrote a book, you know, that you might be interested in taking a look at. And he very kindly said, yes, he would and uh, took away a copy of Against Criticism, read it and said he was very interested in it and would I like to join him in some research he was doing in which I was effectively able to take advantage of some work that he'd already done over a long period of collating information on patients with various um, psychiatric disorders. So that's how it all started. And over the years, John has um, very willingly given of his time in conversation and in other ways, directing me to things that I might be interested in but didn't know about. In fact, my interest in Max Shaler comes entirely through John, who has uh, translated um, for the first time into English some of Shaler's work. Um, and when I was uh, in Johns Hopkins in Baltimore in 1992, so two years roughly after, or perhaps even only a year after we'd, we'd met, um, I got a very excited missive from John saying, there's an amazing book called Madness and Modernism by an American psychologist, Louis Sass. You've got to read it. And I did. And that became the other plank um, of my uh, interest in lateralization. Not, I should, hesitate, um, should uh, quickly point out, not that Louis Sass talks about lateralization, but he does talk very much about schizophrenia. Now, at that point, I think what I'd like to ask John, I've explained how I came to be caught up in this business of lateralization, but how was it that you, John, came to be so interested in it? And did it have anything to do with schizophrenia? Oh, well, thank you very much for those, those comments, Ian. Well, let's go back to 20 years, you see, because I started in psychiatry in the early 1970s, and almost straight away, I... Um, thought that schizophrenia was such an extraordinary condition. The, the people I was seeing and the, the books that I read about it. And on the one hand, the extant explanations at that time were woefully inadequate. <laughs> and yet it seemed to me that there must be some explanation. So there was a sort of polarized between the current inadequate explanations and the the very fact that, that you know something must explain it. So, for instance, there were social explanations like 
overprotective mothers. Well, um, there are plenty of overprotective mothers around, and whether any of their children became schizophrenic or not, um, how could that in itself explain a delusion such as um, thinking that rays were penetrating your brain? It just didn't make sense to me. And then there were lots and lots of psychological explanations. Virtually every mental function that you could think of, attention, perception, thinking, consciousness, had been incriminated in, um, in the um, causation of schizophrenia. Now, I actually did a lot of psychological experiments around that time. And um, one that struck me most was had come by chance. There was a theory around that um, there was something wrong with the way schizophrenics categorized the world. So a sort of typical instance and a sort of out of you know out of order incidents were, were were not were not appreciated. So I started. I gave them a little test. So I had them um, say a robin and a pterodactyl as an example of a typical bird and a atypical bird, and. I showed them these and asked them which they thought you know was more you know typical of a bird. But then I thought I better have a control task to make sure that they were attending. And I chose faces. So there was one happy man and one grumpy man. And I asked them which was the happier. Now this was so simple that my children, who were only three and five at the time, could do it easily. They got them all right. And to my amazement, the the category um, items they, they did quite well on but they were no better than chance on deciding which um you know person was was more happy and i thought that was um, quite remarkable and i then discovered that this in neurological parlance is called prosopagnosia for facial expressions and that even at that time was regarded as a right hemisphere um, problem yes, and then the, even the neurological explanations around at the time didn't um, account for the particular pattern of, of, of schizophrenia. And most of them didn't say any more than that there must be some you know, brain damage. But the whole um, history of schizophrenia had been that the first person to properly describe it, a German called Kreppelin, um, had called it dementia prycox, meaning early dementia. It's, the Swiss psychiatrist Bloiler, who came along a few years later, said, no, no, that, that's not correct. It's not a dementia. It's something different. And that's why he called it schizophrenia, from a splitting or a, a shattering of the mind. And then um, over the years, um, up until I, I met you, as more and more information about right hemisphere um, functioning and left hemisphere functioning came in, I was just absolutely convinced that um, there was something similar between right hemisphere <laughs> damage and, and schizophrenia. To my mm. amazement, mm. not one person <laughs> was, was was interested in this and, and I, you know, I've seen some of your previous talks and you you also had the same um, sort of negative feedback from people about um, anyone who, who, who dared to step into this sort of murky um, murky pool. <laughs> And what struck me about you was that you you saw from the word go how how interesting and um, important this, this 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 theory was. Yes, I mean you, you pointed out that prosopagnosia, which is something that um, we find in schizophrenia, the difficulty in reading faces, is a right hemisphere disorder. But you also amassed a vast amount of information about people with right hemisphere deficits and logged the way in which they were similar to patients with schizophrenia. Yes. And I think that the key to me, and what was so exciting, was that you set all this in a philosophical context. You weren't simply saying, well, the, there's this finding, there's that finding, clearly they're bonkers, you know, they think this. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you were saying, what seems to have happened is that there is a coherence to their world in a way, but it's one, a world that's very different from ours, has different qualities from ours. And it's rather like the world that the person with right hemisphere deficits uh, experiences. And one of the sayings I sometimes quote from you, and you may even not remember saying it, but nonetheless, I love it, is 
that um, psychiatry is a branch of philosophy and that medicine is a branch of psychiatry. And I, I think that's so, so right that yeah. behind all this, we are dealing with the business of a human being's experience of the world. And outside of that context, you cannot understand what they are experiencing, whether it's mentally or physically, and that everything has to be understood in terms of the whole person, not just as a fragmentary phenomenon. What do you think about that? Oh, yes, I think that's very good. So what, what really happened from the 90s onwards was that um, I became disillusioned with, with psychology as a, as a discipline, because it didn't seem to me to, to cover the, the sort of issues that you've, you, you've just been talking about. And I, I then moved on to consider what I call the, the, the philosophical inventory. That, that, that this was the, um, the areas I became interested in. So space, time, movement, individuality, um, thingness, you know, what, what makes a, a, a thing as opposed to a living living person. So there were a whole set of categories which which psychologists had absolutely nothing to say about. And that's when I got into the, um, the philosophical area. And then Max Shaler, I got interested in him because he, more than any philosopher I'd, I'd, I'd read, and even some of the um, um, 20th century philosophers, he seemed to understand um, the um, area that I was I was talking about. It was the only philosopher that, that seemed to um, pinpoint the, the the sort of issues that I thought might um, be responsible for, for schizophrenia. So, so that that was the move then. Well, I think some viewers may be thinking very interesting, but I don't see what this has got to do with schizophrenia. So perhaps you could help us there. Um, well, that's that's um, a slightly different point. This this was me, if you like, taking off into into um, philosophy, but yes. um, that this got more, I think, to do with the 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 hemispheres because I I, I do think that each each hemisphere has a um, um, takes part in this value perception and, and and so each hemisphere has a different as you were you use the word take um so so some values are are um, um grasped by the right hemisphere and 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 some by the left hemisphere i've got a feeling we might um, have a disagreement about that but that's 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 what i think i think from yeah. the you can move on to schizophrenia because I think that one of the problems with schizophrenics or people with schizophrenia is that they actually grasp a, a sort of higher value than the normal person do. They're very bad on practical things. If you ask them to, you know, mend a light or something, they're very poor about it. And that they much prefer to talk about religion and science and you know the, the world. And, and in some ways, they're Sort of philosophers manque <laughs> because you know they're they're internally sort of attracted by by the the, the higher level of values and, and so they're they're in, in in their everyday life they they often cope extremely badly because they're too busy um, um philosophizing all the time so so yeah so, so <laughs> the, 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 there is a um, implication for schizophrenia as well yes i mean i i I think probably we do differ a little bit about the, the, the values in relation to the hemispheres, but um, maybe we can come on to that. But I think that where I would agree entirely is that they're dealing with something in the abstract. And this is why I think that the, the notion of thingness has to be rather carefully glossed, because it can mean a number of things. It can mean being very down to earth, or it can mean seeing things as inanimate and seeing... Um, static things rather than processes. Um, these can all be aspects of thingness. And I would say that the, the left hemisphere um, and schizophrenia as a left hemisphere hypertrophy or overdrive yeah. condition involves excessive abstraction, taking things out of context um, and simply not having them rooted 
in the embodied world that Merleau-Ponty would say is the, the, our way of actually taking a hold on the world and understanding it. So they're, they're very disembodied in a way that a lot of the worst kind of philosophers are. <laughs> so when one says they're philosophers, they're like, very like, the, the worst kind of Anglo-American analytic philosophers who are yes, off somewhere oh, yeah. in ent yeah. entirely um, theoretical realm. Whereas yeah. there's another kind of philosophy, which I think the continental philosophers of the 20th century have been better at understanding, which is not uh, abstracted in this way.